Today, you will hear about some really exciting new research that is happening at ISP. And this is research on uh, tuberculosis, uh, which is the world's deadliest infectious disease. Um, and tuberculosis, uh, or TB as it is known uh, in short, the threat of TB is growing even more now because there are strains of TB, MTB, that have emerged that are not easily killed by any of the frontline drugs or antibiotics that are used typically in the clinic. And antimicrobial resistance is something you might have heard. It's called AMR for short. It's a major concern, not just for TB, but for multiple infectious diseases. And it's expected that by the year 2050, about 10 million people will be killed because of AMR infections. So it's really an urgent need to figure out new ways of finding antibiotics that are um, very effective in killing pathogens like uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis or MTB. So that's what we're going, we're going to hear about today from uh, Dr. Eliza Peterson. Eliza is a senior research scientist in my lab, and her goal is to understand the underlying complexity of tuberculosis and specifically its infectious agent uh, as I mentioned, mycobacterium tuberculosis. Eliza has constructed these computational models that allows her to dig into some of the inner workings of the pathogen to understand how it regulates all of the genes that are encoded in its genome. And that allows it to adapt to a wide array of complex challenges it has to negotiate inside the host. And using this model, Eliza has now started to dig into some of the mechanisms of antimicrobial resistance. And she's identifying new genes that will allow us to de devise uh, better drugs that can kill the pathogen and prevent resistance strains from arising. So with that, uh, I would like to hand this over to Eliza. And Eliza, the floor is yours. I'm excited to share some of our uh, recent work and how, it, like Nitin said, it has the potential to improve treatment for infectious diseases such as tuberculosis. Um, you know, so as Nitin mentioned, you know, largely our, our motivation in finding new treatments for infectious diseases is the growing rise of antimicrobial resistance. Um, 700,000 people uh, die per year from antimicrobial resistant infections globally. And um, around 200,000 of these are from multi-drug and extensively drug resistant TB alone. And in the US, there are um, over 2 million antimicrobial resistant infections a year. And this costs the US health system about $20 billion in excess costs. And so, you know, it's AMR is, is considered a significant threat to the public health systems, not just in developing countries, but throughout the world and here in the U.S. as well. And so, um, you know, uh, antimicrobial resistance is defined as the ability of a microbe to grow in an, in an inhibitory concentration of an antimicrobial. You know, so this means that it we need a high, to use higher doses of the antimicrobial, antimicrobials, or it makes some drugs not effective at all. And there's uh, many factors that are contributing to the growing rise in AMR cases. And this includes the misuse and overuse of antimicrobials in the clinical or hospital setting. Also, the extensive use of antimicrobials in agricultural practices, and this you know, far exceeds the, the human clinical use of antimicrobials. And then there's also global factors uh, such as climate change, and this climate change and, you know, uh, um, can, you know, this can put some high selective pressure on bacteria to adapt and mutate, and this allows for the gain of resistance. And so if we you know, continue at the current rate, it's predicted as Nitin mentioned that resistant infections will kill 10 million people per year by 2050. And that this could add um, around a hundred trillion, excuse me, trillion cumulative costs to the world economy. And if this is the case that um, this would put uh, deaths by AMR greater than any other major cause of death 
including cancer. And so it's obvious that, you know, without better um, antimicrobial stewardship and, you know, a robust antibiotic pipeline, we're facing a huge crisis worldwide and a risk to modern medicine as we know it. And so we're really interested in how we can stop this trajectory so that, you know, this, this current uh, prediction where we're gonna get you know, 10 million deaths from AMR in the year 2050, how we can stop this and reverse this trend and potentially get fewer deaths from AMR. And so this is really our, our um, main research question is, is how, you know, better understanding of how pathogens evade and survive drug treatment. And our strategy is to elucidate the regulatory and metabolic networks in pathogenic bacteria to understand how they are able to respond and survive the stresses they encounter during infection or drug treatment and use knowledge of these networks to fight antimicrobial resistance um, by identifying new drug targets, uh, new drug combinations, and, and vaccine strategies. And our network approach is you know, applicable to all pathogens, um, and we're currently working with uh, computational models of E. coli and salmonella and C. difficile. Um, but the focus of my work, as Nitin mentioned, has been on mycobacterium tuberculosis. And, and part of this reason is um, that mycobacterium tuberculosis, or MTB as I will refer to it as, is particularly successful at evading drug treatment. MTB has you know, many mechanisms that allow it to escape killing from drugs. It's able to form these kind of zombie-like cells and it has this very unique cell wall that I, I will um, discuss in a little bit. But all of these uh, mechanisms contribute to why it's so difficult to treat TB. And so the, you know, the standard of care um, requires four drugs to be taken at least once a day for six to nine months. And that these drugs um, result in a variety of, of serious side effects, including things like blindness and hearing loss. And this is the best case scenario if um, a patient has drug susceptible TB. Uh, in the case of infections from resistant strains, um, treatment extends to two years. It, it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars and uh, requires around 15,000 pills. And so it's said if you, you know, stack up these pills end to end, it, it's equivalent to the height of the Golden Gate Bridge. So it's obvious that we, you know, we need better uh, treatments for TB. And, and we see uh, systems biology in, protect, in particular can offer some really great potential in developing better drug regimens to treat TB. And so, you know, using systems biology approaches, we can leverage large data sets of MTB and, and model the data in a way that we could make predictions that, you know, drive discovery of, of new and improved drug treatments. And towards this, um, we, we published the first predictive system scale gene re regulatory network model for MTB in 2014. And then just recently, we published kind of an updated regulatory network model, which you know provides more detail about gene function and, and regulatory interactions, and under you know what conditions these interactions are active. And so then our goal is to 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 mine the information in these uh, you know computational models to make meaningful predictions that could improve the treatment of TB. And an, an important aspect is that we also want to experimentally validate our model predictions. And we feel this is really um, important for bridging systems biology approaches with actual clinical translation um, and getting drugs to, to the patients. And so, you know, similar to working with COVID, COVID um, and you might have seen clips of this on the news, um, experimental work with MTB requires you know, special biological safety level three facilities, um, which we use across the street at Seattle Children's Research Institute. 
And so, you know, it's it's quite difficult to work in this environment. And, you know, um, not only that, uh, MTV is an extremely slow growing org organism. So it really makes um, predictive modeling all the more important. <clears throat> so towards this and, you know, using computational models, a major interest of mine is using the models to better, better understand the dynamics of MTB cell wall, you know, with the aim of improving treatment for TB. And so, as I mentioned um, earlier, um, part of the reason why MTB is so successful at evading drug treatment, you know, and why it requires such extensive and long treatment is this elaborate cell wall. And so here I'm showing a cartoon of the MTB cell wall. You can see it's many layers and different components. And you know the, the cell wall has really evolved to act like um, kind of like candle wax so that nothing gets through. And in fact, um, during my PhD, I was also looking at new targets and, and um, identifying drugs for preventing the development of resistance. Um, and any promising drug candidate that we found, you know, it could work on many um, other pathogens, you know, mo sometimes most other pathogens, but it would never work on uh, MTB. It's kind of like MTB is this its own separate beast. And so, you know, not only does it have all these different layers and components, th these layers can change in their composition and also the amounts of the different layers depending on the conditions where the pathogen lives. And so over the course of infection, MTB resides in different tissues and parts of the body, and it therefore has different strategies to deal with these different microenvironments. Um, and a major strategy it has is this remodeling of its cell wall and that this is dependent on the you know, available nutrients um, as well as, you know, remodeling to serve as a barrier to a particular environment. But this, the cell wall remodeling has to be tightly controlled. Um, and so we're trying to use our computational models to better understand the players and under what conditions this, um, this cell wall remodeling is, is taking place. And so recently, um, and what I'll talk about today is uh, the characterization of one particular player. And this is what we um, published in cell reports recently, um, that being the gene MTRA. And so as a transcriptional regulator, MTRA controls many other players involved with cell remod remodeling. And we kind of see as a, it serving as a, a conductor you know, to this kind of uh, uh, process of cell wall remodeling. And so as, as part of our characterization of MTRA, we uh, used the gene editing technology CRISPR to, to abolish MTRA. And then we fluorescently labeled the cells and visualized them under the microscope. And so um, on the left then is, is normal MTB um, where the cells grow and divide, grow and divide. And you can see, um, you know, Two, two cells close together there, which is indicative that they just separated. Um, but on the right, when with MTRA knockdown, um, the cells just keep growing and never divide. And this, that's because during cell division, the cell wall needs to be cut so the, the, you know the daughter cells can physically separate. And so without proper MTRA function, these cuts in the cell wall just don't happen and the cells never divide or you know physically separate. And then another consequence of MTRA knockdown that we discovered was an increase in MTB susceptibility to antimicrobials. And here, um, here we, we tested the potency of various drugs when MTRA was abolished, again, using CRISPR. And what this graph is showing is that the longer the bar, the greater the potency of the drug with MTRA knockdown. And that we also found that the bigger the drug, the greater the potency. And you can see this, you know, going, uh, kind of going down the graph and the bars. 
so that we found that you know changes in the cell wall as a result of MTRA knockdown increases the permeability of the cell wall you know better allowing drugs especially large drugs to get into and kill MTB um so uh, like many others this time of year, uh, we visited a, a pumpkin patch last weekend and, and went through a corn maze. And it, it, it made me think of an analogy to what is happening you know, with the cell wall and MTRA. Um, and so, you know, while running through the, the corn maze, uh, my daughter is only three. So, you know, as a small person, she could actually slip through the, the tightly spaced corn stalks. However, myself as an adult and therefore a larger person, you know, I, I can't fit through the tightly spaced uh, corn stalks. And even my daughter, you know, she'd eventually get stuck in these thick rows of corn. Only where there's, you know, paths through the corn could all of us, you know, large or small get through. And so you can kind of imagine that this is the case with MTRA knockdown. There's, you know, channels in the cell wall that more effectively deliver drugs into the cell. And so the, this, you know, effectively means that we can use lower amounts of drug and anything we can do to lower the drug concentration is helpful. And so we uh, demonstrated this with two frontline TB drugs that are part of the standard of care treatment for TB. Um, that's isoniazid and rifampicin. And I'll just I'll I'll walk you through these kill curves here. They look technical, but I'll, you know I'll walk them walk you through them. And so in black is MTB with normal MTRA levels. And then in, in um, solid black is untreated. And then the dotted black lines are treatment with low doses of the, the two antibiotics. And so in both cases, um, MTB is able to, to grow you know, just fine at these low concentrations of antibiotics. But when we abolish MTRA or knock down MTRA so that there's lower levels of MTRA, and this is shown in orange, and then treat with the same low dose of antibiotics, we decrease the culture a million fold and do this in a really short period of time. So we, we see this as you know, really promising and um, see it as offering the potential of targeting and inhibiting MTRA and how this could lead to better and faster treatment of TB. And so this work was done, um, you know, with many people uh, in the Beliga lab, uh, present and past members of the Beliga lab, as well as collaborators at Seattle Children's and the University of Birmingham, and then with various resources from um, collaborators at Harvard and Indiana University. And our, our funding for our TB research comes from the NSF, the National Institutes of Health, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. That, that's a, a really exciting work. I had a few questions and uh, there's slowly questions coming up in the chat as well. So one of my questions is, um, you mentioned that there's a need for new antibiotics, um, but, but there's with MTB and, and some of these difficult pathogens, uh, people are trying to look for new ways of killing the pathogen. So with this particular target that you've identified, MTRA, would that represent a new class of drugs if you were to find one? It, it would. So as far as um, classes of antibiotics go, this targeting a transcription factor really hasn't done been done before. But we see there's a couple of reasons why the, <clears throat> this is promising is that <clears throat> MTRA itself uh, leads to lower viability of MTB. So it's what's considered an essential target so that it could be a drug in itself. But the fact that it's a transcription factor and therefore controls all these other processes of, in, involved at the cell wall and has other advantages in terms of its potentiation or you know 
activity with other drugs, it, it, it's, um, it's even more attractive as a target. Yeah, and you know when you mentioned that this is a transcription factor, and um, for the audience, transcription factors essentially are these, as Eliza mentioned, conductors of an orchestra where the players are essentially all the genes that are encoded in the genome. So this transcription factor is essentially deciding which genes are being expressed when and to what levels. And then those genes essentially encode enzymes and other structural proteins that go on to carry out cell processes, including making the cell wall. And <clears throat> what particularly struck me in with uh, th now transcription factor being a target is MTB is known to be able to live in many different heterogeneous states. And heterogeneity is kind of a hallmark you know, in cancers and in, you know, in tuberculosis and uh, a hallmark in the sense that it gives the capability for the organism or the cell to kind of hide away in a different state where the antibiotic cannot kill you. So this does this transcription factor, you think, control how MTB transitions from one state to another? And so essentially is preventing it from kind of hiding away and running away from the antibiotic. Yeah, I think in particular because it's in, involved with cell divisions and growth. So it's been shown that, you know, by decreasing growth, MTB can kind of go into a, a, a dormant state, they call it. And so the, effectively, this dormant state is hiding away from, you know, the immune system, hiding away from drugs. And so I do see it as being able to, to tr transition between the, this dormant state and, you know, actively replicating state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the questions in the chat is kind of related to this is, you know, the you know, we've, we've seen this over and over again, you introduce a new antibiotic and within a year sometimes or sooner, you see a resistance strain kind of cropping up somewhere and then spreading and making that antibiotic useless, right? So. Mm -hmm. Now the question in this case is, uh, have you found maybe a, um, for lack of a better word, a, I'll use a cliche term, an Achilles heel, which will cripple the pathogen and essentially render it not as effective in escaping treatment? Um, I mean, we haven't shown that yet, but I think, um, you know, possibly by using lower dosages of drugs, there's, you know, less chance of, of developing drug resistance. I think that's, you know, that's a main goal of using, you know, lower concentrations of drugs. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's our hope. Um, but we, we'd obviously love, love to, to show that and the, how it's, um, and the consequence of developing resistance. Yeah. yeah. So before I come back to more TV questions, uh, there's a, a very basic but very important question. Uh, what do you mean by a knockdown? Can you can you explain how the CRISPR-I technology works? Yeah, so I mean, CRISPR, you you direct, um, a, a, it prevents the expression of a gene in particular. So you direct um, this, this uh, CRISPR protein to, uh, a particular gene of interest and that this kind of CRISPR protein sits basically kind of on, on, on this region of the gene and it stops the expression of, of the gene or it doesn't necessarily stop it all the way, but it can lower the expression of the gene so that, you know, compared to a wild type, it, there'll be lower levels of MTRA when we say knockdown. And when I say lower levels, at the transcriptional level and then at the protein level once it's uh, translated into a protein. Yeah, and I must say CRISPR has really revolutionized how we do research and you know, everybody uh, nowadays uses CRISPR across a whole range of different systems. And that used to be kind of a major bottleneck, but you know what I've seen with CRISPR is it's so easily tunable to whichever gene you want to target. So. Um, number one, there's many ways people have used CRISPR from what I understand. And I think in CRISPR-I, the way from, from your paper, the way we did it was to uh, take these, design these small RNA sequences that would tell this CRISPR machinery you know, where in the genome 
uh, which genes specifically it should go to and prevent from being expressed. And um, it's very easy to kind of make these RNAs and then tune this. And and the other thing that you know you did really nicely in the paper is uh, you you use the small RNAs uh, and you know tune the sequences. You can control how much the expression of the gene is turned down. And so the knockdown essentially means you knock down the the level of the gene expression and you can mm -hmm. control it. And I think with MTR particularly that, I, if I remember, was really important, right? Yeah, because it's, as I mentioned, it's essential for, you know, viability of the bacteria by, you know, just knock down, you're still able to get some growth and therefore can do some experiments, you know, with, with, with the MTRI knockdown. And similarly, we had to do the, the, like what you mentioned, like tune the different guide RNAs to get different levels because we found, you know, with our first knockdown, we were, we weren't getting very much growth at all. So we kind of had to tune the guide RNA to get enough growth yet still get a, a phenotype in terms of, you know, impaired cell wall. Yeah. Right. So there's a kind of related question, not directly related to your research, but for TB. Now, can you give your thoughts on why we don't have a vaccine for TB? Is there any vaccine in the works? Um, I mean, yeah, there, there's definitely a lot of um, research going into new vaccines um, and adjuvants to the, the currently used BCG um, vaccine, how to improve the kind of, um, you know, efficacy of the currently used uh, BCG vaccine. Um, I, I can't tell you the most promising research in, in that in that field right now, but uh, that's definitely a, a an, another um, area of focus is um, to, to to develop a, a vaccine. Yeah. Yeah, and, and if I remember correctly, there are some vaccines that are showing promise. There was a vaccine that did show some promise, but there's also you know the the market forces not not always in favor of you know developing some of these treatments and vaccines for. Um, you no know, neglected diseases like TB because it inflicts primarily people in the developing world. And as you showed in one of your slides, uh, I think the regular course of treatment, which goes over six months, costs about seventeen thousand um, dollars. And which you know, for people who make a dollar a day or less, that's really not a, something uh, uh, that's even remotely affordable. And in turn, that kind of is a disincentive for some of these large companies or any any effort, because as you can see, it takes a lot of work, a lot of people to do this research. So this whole whole system seems to be a little um, not built appropriately for addressing diseases like TB. So do you think the models you've developed and the systems approach can accelerate some of the discovery and make it a bit cheaper? Yeah, I mean, I think they're like, you know, they're all publicly available. So I think, you know, people in, that are doing the research can turn to these models for to 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 get some information about, you know, if they have a you know a target of interest that, you know, under what conditions it might be um, useful to test them in. Um, yeah, I, I think the models as as a can, you know, facilitate. A lot of different types of drug discovery or therapeutic discovery for TB. Yeah, and there's a, there's actually a question here, kind of directly related to what we we're just discussing, uh, and and uh, this comes from Joe. He asks, now are there other genes beyond MTRA that might have a similar impact on MTB's capability to divide, and uh, is this potentially one finding of many that can change the way TB is understood and treated? I mean, I, I would. Add to that, I mean, you know, you, you use a systems biology approach, and from uh, you know what you've described, the model essentially is agnostic of any particular um, class of genes. It discovers all the genes in the genome. So, in principle, you know, you could find many, many, many targets by with this model. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. So not just transcription factors, but any any gene. Yeah. In 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 the the genome, yeah. And how how can people get access to this model? 
Um, the model is you know, included in our publication, um, and also there's a, a, a MTV portal that has the kind of the information from the EGRIN2 and the original EGRIN model, which are, which are our regulatory network models. So people can go online and just search for their favorite genes or just download the model or even yeah. the method with which the model was constructed. Right, yeah, to make a model for whatever pathogen or organism of interest, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Yoshi is, first he congratulates you on the work, and uh, then the question that he asks is, uh, uh, can you speculate on you know, exactly how MTRA might be regulating permeability of the cell wall? Uh, and are any of the target genes that it controls structural components of the cell wall? Um, are they structural? Um, n no, the, the genes that it's regulating as far as, you know, the model suggests and then our kind of our, our characterization are not actually components of the cell wall, but they are modifying parts of the cell wall. So, you know, for instance, in terms of cell division, there's uh, peptidoglycan hydrolases. So these are responsible for, you know, cutting um, the, the peptidoglycan layer. There's also some genes involved with transporting some of the um, uh, lipids and, and to the myco, like the mycolic acid layer. Um, so they're more responsible for putting the components in the right places or <clears throat> making the correct modifications at the, the necessary times. Yeah. And I think there was a first part of the question. No, I think you, you covered okay. uh, uh, much of what was asked. Yeah. So, um, so in this network, so MTRA is controlling, would you say like uh, half a dozen or a dozen genes or something like that? Uh, mm -hmm. And can you can you give a perspective on how traditionally one might have gone about finding this this uh, target um, and how did the model accelerate it? You know, and th this is kind of from the left field from me. Um, so if if you were a regular drug discovery person, would you have found this target, or would it be impossible to find a target like this? Um, I think. Um, I, I, I don't know exactly how to answer that, but I would think it might be discovered just in the fact that MTRA is essential, right? Um, and so there's a lot of studies that ha have, um, have looked at the genome wide, um, characterization of, of, uh, essential genes in MTB because of their you know, potential drug target um, promise. And so MTRA does fall in that, that classification. What I didn't really touch on in, in the presentation, but what I think the model really let us do is to, to more characterize when MTRA is, is, is modifying the cell wall. So <clears throat> the model was able to, you know, suggest under certain stressful conditions, you know, low pH in particular, nu nutrient starvation, and when there's, you know, little oxygen is really when it's necessary for MTRA to you know, kind of like slow down cell division and also make modifications to the cell wall that allow the MTB to adapt to those particular conditions. So I think, you know, yes, maybe FTRA would have been stumbled upon based on, you know, these, these gene essentiality um, studies, but to get at the kind of the level of characterization that's, you know, really needed for proper drug discovery, the model was really able to, to get, a, get us there. Right. And I think that what the model does is it tells you uh, which genes are important for a particular context in which MDP is adapted. And it tells you who's the conductor, who's the regulator of those genes. Um, how does it control those genes? And um, it allows you to then develop further assays to, to characterize. I think one thing you mentioned is, even if you, know, you had a brute force method identify the target, kind of understanding what 
phenotype or what mechanisms it controls is a whole different ball game. I think that yeah. Yeah. that is incredibly difficult to do. So, so that's why the model kind of accelerates discovery and downstream characterization of such targets. Yeah. So um, let's see. We covered quite a few questions here. Yeah, I'm trying to understand this question here uh, before I ask you. I'll pass on that. Um, so well, a question here is how optimistic are you about these findings? Where do you go from here? So now that you have a target, and uh, as you said, we can find many more targets like this using the model. What happens next? Yeah, I mean, we'd like to find a drug, right, that can inhibit MTRA. And, and some of the other targets that, you know, we didn't have time to go into today that we found from the, you know, our, our computational models. Um, but, um, you know, that that requires partnering with people that have the small molecules and, and you know, the, the, the kind of facilities to run these kind of high throughput assays. Um, and we're, we're currently exploring some of those uh, collaborations with another target. Um, also, we do know that MTRA is, is of interest now for the, um, what's called the TB Drug Alliance. And so that kind of puts people, the TB Drug Alliance tries to put researchers with, um, together with people that have, you know, maybe the resource, other resources that they need. So, you know, trying to find people who could um, uh, do, the, do the, the drug discovery process for MTRA. So we do know that that's kind of being pursued from the TB Drug Alliance. And you yeah, mentioned it's finding these molecules that can inhibit um, MTRA. So, so you mentioned that it's something that that we're doing. Can you tell people a little bit more about you know, some other target for which we're finding some small molecules? Yeah. So we um, a particular interest of mine is another transcription factor that's also in, involved in cell wall remodeling. Again, as I mentioned, that's a that's a favorite uh, topic of mine. And um, there we have a, a, another transcription factor that is, um, yeah, that we think is is important during infection. And there's some, you know, mouse studies to to, to support that. And so we are currently um, partnering with Relay Therapeutics, and they have um, what's called a DNA encoded library. So these are kind of fragments of molecules that are um, attached to, to to DNA. And then you take the, the MADR protein and you look for binding of these fragments, and then you kind of pull that down and then sequence it. And you get all the different fragments that are able to bind to the, to the protein. And they, they then use machine learning and um, are able to put together these fragments into to molecules that they predict will bind to, to your, your uh, target protein. And so <clears throat> uh, we don't have results from that. That's actually currently being done right now, but that's, a, that's one way that we're trying to find inhibitors of this other uh, um, uh, drug target for a TB. Right, I mean, that, I think that's uh, a really exciting project and, and the Gates Foundation is funding that. Yeah. And I think that really brings together the power of machine learning and AI across you know, application to biology in kind of constructing the model, the kind of model that you described and using that model to find targets in a much more uh, kind of um, informed and uh, model directed way. And then characterizing the target like you did MTRA, but as you said, there's a MADA, there's I believe a bunch of other targets that are in the pipeline. But then again, you use high, the power of high throughput technology, the DNA encoded library you mentioned, you know, will also allow you to kind of do a pool screen because traditionally you would do one molecule at a time, but here you essentially have, you know, I don't know how many, they have billions or trillions of molecules that are all DNA barcoded and you just find out which ones bind to this protein that uh, is of interest. And then you again bring in machine learning and AI and some of this was developed at uh, Google research. And so you know, some people from Google started Relay Therapeutics. And I think 
So you bring, you know, again, the power of computational science to, to go through those molecules, fragments of molecules and predict what might be a good drug candidate, which then circles back and you can then try out and see if those drugs are in fact uh, inhibiting this target and killing uh, MTB. So, so th that's at least my hope is that by bringing in these automation and you know ML AI type approaches and high throughput technologies, we could hopefully bring down the cost of finding new molecules. Of course, there, there's the whole expense and time with clinical trials and safety, and that you know is, is a fairly long journey. But if we can front load it with you know high value molecules, hopefully we can make a big difference there. Um, and that's a, another research roundtable we should address is ways that we're trying to reduce the clinical trial time and, and measure treatment response using transcriptomic signatures and things like that. So I guess that's kind of our general theme is how we can use machine learning and AI to kind of speed up this process and reduce the costs and yeah, get the drugs to the people that need it. Yeah, 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 you're absolutely right. I mean, across the chain from... Uh you know, from laboratory to patient, there's so many places where systems biology, machine learning, AI can make huge impact. And yeah. um, it's good to be involved in different stages of that work. Um, but did you want to comment on uh, the kinds of partnerships? And you mentioned with Relay Therapeutics and so on, how important are these partnerships to doing the kind of research you're doing? Oh yeah, they're they're extremely valuable. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I I mean, we can only do so much, um, and you know, yeah. To being able to take it into translation, you it, these partnerships are, you know, absolutely crucial. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 you know, we should mention we have collaborators around the world. You know, in South Africa, and in, in the UK, in India, Mexico all over the US. And I think it's really encouraging to see so many people working on such an important problem and, and being willing to kind of share their expertise, their results, reagents. Um, that's one thing I've really enjoyed in the TB research communities. Everyone is driven by one singular goal is to get rid of this damn thing. So Yeah. And like you mentioned, like it's not, um, it's just not financially, beneficial for pharmaceutical companies to to work in this space so it has to be done by academic researchers i think we kind of you know unite under that under under that kind of um idea too right? that right. we're the ones that have to do it yeah yeah so there's a crystal ball question here um so what is the potential time frame for studying your findings in the field, uh, in TB patients. Like, let's say if we were to find a small molecule for MTRA, how long would it take before there's a drug based on this target in the clinic? Oh, I mean, there's a lot of statistics out there in terms of the time for clinical trial, but I think it's like 15 to 20 years, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, so once the let's drug... Say is yeah. identified, you have to run safety trials and then you know, first animal models, right? So you have to do mouse yeah. studies and then non-human primates and then human clinical trials. And you know we didn't touch on the, the different lineages of MTB that exist out there and you know they, they all have slightly different biology. Um, and then yeah, the clinical trials themselves take a really long time and they're really expensive to run. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm a bit more optimistic that we might be able to get there before 15 to 20 years, maybe a shorter time frame. Well, hopefully some of the efficiencies that we talked about in monitoring drug response, drug efficacy, and the drug susceptibility tests we're developing, et cetera, could, could make those timelines shorter, hopefully. And I mean, the huge need for these new TB drugs too, you know, sometimes things can be sped up um, in terms of prioritizing clinical trials when, you know, when you have a, a, a therapeutic need for them. Yeah. 
Yeah, and you know, I think um, the one thing we should mention as well, the the outlook that we start off with always is quite um, frightening in terms of you know what, where we might be in 2050. I think we should also point out that there are some really uh, exciting uh, developments in the TB field. And just was it a few years, two, three years ago that a triple drug regimen was approved um, with bedaclin, pretominid, and linezolid. Um, yeah. You know, which is for specifically for AMR TB, right? And it's showing a lot of promise. It's, I believe, it's got a shorter time frame of treatment duration than the yeah. conventional therapy. Yeah. Yeah. So it's reducing the treatment down to around two months, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and the relapse rates are also lower, from what I understand. Which is exciting. I mean, if you think about yeah, AMR TB, you know, you, yeah. right? So AMR TB takes about up to three years and fifteen thousand pills. And you know, one thing that you had told me was if you put the pills end to end, they, they, it's as tall as the Golden Gate Bridge. And and each of these pills comes with like enormous side effects, like debilitating side effects. To replace all of that with a triple drug regimen that can treat TB in resistant TB in two months or so, I think is quite a remarkable development. Very promising. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I don't, I didn't want to leave people with this, uh, you know, just, just the doom and doom kind of a scenario. I think there is like the work you're doing and developments that people have made, it does seem like you're making headway into, into TB and hopefully this is generalizable to other infectious diseases as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's yep. That's our that's our goal. Mm -hmm. Great, great. So, you know, with that, I think maybe we should uh, close the session today. Yeah, this was super exciting. Thanks for taking the time, Eliza, and sharing your work with everyone, and then sitting through this you know very engaging question and answer session. <laughs>